yeah, the previous presenters have given a great overview of the state of gender archaeology um, at our time, and I will present a very specific case study of um, re-examining women's role in, in this case, Near Eastern prehistory. So, mostly I'll be talking about this relief, the famous garden relief from the northern palace of Ashurbanipal, found in Iraq, dated in um, 645 BC. Um, currently, in the British Museum is described as the most one of the most remarkable, also most um, enigmatic subjects in Near Eastern prehistory. So, what is depicted here is we can see the Assyrian king, a queen, attendants in the garden. This is the head of the Elamite king, whom um, the Assyrian king has just defeated, hanging on a tree in the garden. So, looks pretty straightforward and happy, not really. And the question is, my question is at least, who is the queen? Who are her attendants and what are they doing there? So, As I, um, I'm an art historian by training, I hope to identify the queen through formal analysis and contextualization of her iconography, as well as to deconstruct the discourse of domination of the woman and through the woman as part of the Assyrian visual narrative or, or propaganda. And the debate usually surrounds the question of is she Elamite or Assyrian? Scholars such as Yaviel Alvaras Mon have argued that she is actually an Elamite queen, um, meaning the wife of this guy, unfortunately, um, based on written history of Ashurbanipal's capture of the Elamite queen, as well as the princes um, of El Elam, and then bringing them to Assyria. Um, basically, these such, a, such kind of reliefs are found throughout Ashurbanipal's um, Ashurbani garden, showing um, the, the capture and transport of these Elamite subjects. Um, and in this argument, basically, the Assyrian king is acting as a new protector and owner of these conquered Elamite women whose husbands have now been subjugated and mostly killed um, by the Assyrians. Also, his argument is of stylistic elements in the queen's attire in this relief um, that resembles Elamite iconography. And I want to argue the opposite. So... Here is the statue of Queen um, Napirasu, which is an Elamite queen um, from, well, much earlier. But since there are very few representations of, of Elamite women and Assyrian women in general from that time, so it's hard to find contemporary evidence. But basically, Alvarez Moon is arguing that, arguing of stylistic similarities between these two works, um, as well as between Elamite uh, representations of the queen in general and um, the representation in this particular work. But if we look more closely of not only this image, but also other representations of the Elamite queen, we can see that in traditional Elamite representation, the garment is more close fitting on the upper body, exposing the arms and overall um, full bosoms of the queen while having a widespread rim for the dress and lower body um, with very long fringes while here in, in the relief in question, the whole garment is very um, stiff and straight fitting and de-emphasizing basically the form of the female body hiding the arms and the fringes are not really long but showing the feet instead. Um, and then another argument that Alvarez Mon argued is that there are kind of tiny dots decorating the dresses in both Elamite representation and in the relief in question. But my argument is that these dots are not only found in the queen on the queen's attire, but also on the king's attire. And as well as there are other stylistic parallels between their attire, such as um, these dots lined between two parallel um, stripes here found vertically here and horizontally here to kind of form a harmony and almost count complementary image between these two um, royal figures attires that would make more sense if um, if the Assyrians are just taking this Elamite iconography to put in their garment instead of for this queen herself to be Elamite. So basically, 
In that sense, Assyria and the creation absorbing artistic influences from the regions it uh, conquered, and the dress therefore becomes an epitome of the empire itself, and maps Elamite iconography, in this case the little round dots, on its surface, just like how the land of Elam is now mapped onto the territory of the grand glutinous Assyrian Empire. Essentially, an Assyrian queen wearing an Elamite-inspired garment as a, as a form of appropriation is more powerful as a visual image of dominance um, than, a, than just an Elamite queen wearing an Elamite or Assyrian garment. And then about Alvaro Admos, another point, um, we can look at how elite Elamite refugees are usually depicted in Assyrian imagery, and they're usually depicted in kind of humiliated ways. This is the, the, the prince of um, the Elamite Empire who was conquered, and um, as the description shows, it's not he's not exactly a dignified figure in this image, while here the queen is quite dignified. She is obviously lower, um, occupies a lower position as the king, but they're still kind of framed by both attendants in the grapevine um, into this kind of exclusive royal inviolable space um, that really elevates her position and celebrates her power. So a question that's not been asked before is if the queen is Assyrian, could her attendants being Elamites, and I think no one has really looked at attendance. Um, so I was looking at all the, a lot of the reliefs of Elamite deportees, especially uh, both from um, from various classes, both like musicians and from higher women of higher class men and women of higher classes in the same palace. And then, well, the Assyrians are really specific about depicting their conquered subjects. So. I've discovered that most of the, I mean, all, all, essentially all of the men and most of the ordinary women, such as musicians or attendants, um, were the sort of headband with, um, with like kind of little knots sort of thing behind the head, behind the head, and then the relatively simple garments. And um, however, elite Elamite women wear this just kind of single round headband without the knots, um, and more complex garments with. Such as here, it's um, oh here we can see both clearly. This is uh, this is elite woman, elite Elamite woman who's deported, but we can see that she's elite because she is um, there are no gods around here. That's, uh, and then also she's carrying a very heavy water jar to feed her infant. Um, we can see similarities between her garment here as well as the garment for the attendants in this image. So my hypothesis is that could it be that these attendants in the Assyrian palace are actually elite Elamite female deportees um, who have not only their lands conquered, but also their elite subjugated and their culture appropriated, so basically did not work for the Assyrian palace. And this kind of strategy of appropriation is not unique to, to human beings, but also to objects. For example, we can see here Egyptian necklace that celebrates um, Ashurbanipal's conquer, conquest of uh, Egypt's 25th dynasty, as well as other, like their Babylonian elements, this lotus flower that he's holding, are uh, all kind of appropriated cultural objects. So. So these all speak to Ashurbanipal's visual message of his ability to access and take resources from other parts of the world. And then, so the key question is then, what is she doing there? So if we look at all these um, iconographic icons between, icons between the king and the queen, such as uh, these decorative elements that I talked about, the posh shows that they're also being parallel. He's lying horizontally and she's sitting very up straight vertically and then with the grapevines and uh, the horizontal grapevines, the very vertical pine trees and such as a table in the middle that occupies both the physical center of this sphere as well as kind of creating many more intersections of, uh, of vertical and horizontal lines, um, kind of cross shapes and that they give a visual impression of balance and stability which then translates into the balance and stability of the empire. And then if we look more closely at the queen's crown um, here, 
we can see similar examples of such mural crown. Um, this is Ashwani Paul's queen that not only further substantiates the argument that she is in fact Assyrian rather than Elamite, but also suggests, but also the iconography of fortified city walls here suggests the inviolability of the queen's physical being, which then translates into the inviolability of that of the empire. So we can say that the figure of the queen is emblematic, emblematic of the land, signifying not only territories, but also in this case, because we have the, the garden taking into account the garden landscape, the um, signifying re reproductive abundance. Here we have a lot of date trees, which are traditionally codified as female because they need to be fertilized by human hand from male pollen trees in the Assyrian visual representation. Only male rulers are, are seen doing that. So, and the palm trees usually don't grow on Assyrian soil. So this is further visual message for the fertilizing power of the Assyrian man, essentially. Because here, if we consider palm trees and all these female attendants in the queen as visually equivalent, passively waiting to basically potentially be fertilized. Um, and then, well, it's hard to talk about reproduction without talking about sex. So, well, on the first, on the one hand, we have the historical association of, of between floral vegetal motifs and sex that's very abundant in Mesopotamian literature. And second of all, the king's position here lying on this bed is very unusual in Assyrian representation. Um, we can see that there is, well, there's no, he's the only male in this scene. There's no competition besides the head of the already dead man on the, on this tree, which uh, not coincidentally is an Assyrian pine tree. So this tree is native to the land, unlike these female palm trees. So it's, it's another sign of domination here. And then if we look more closely, we can see that um, the, the pattern lining the bottom of, uh, of the queen's garment are the same sort of visual detail as the pattern lining the edges of the blanket. Um, so, so here we might detect a, a, a sense of, um, of access and removal. So basically, especially then given their position, the, given the king's reclining position, um, they sort of, you know, what, when she, what, 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 well, the pattern will be touched when her garment is removed and the pattern will be touched when his blanket is removed, sort of form an echo that further strengthens this, this sort of intimacy within this already very intimate, exclusive space framed by the grapevines and by the attendants. And the attendants are there fully at Ashabani Paul's disposal. Um, if my, if my uh, hypothesis that they are actually Elamite elite women holds true, then they are now at his, at his disposal for labor and then potentially for sex to contribute to the economic and the reproductive abundance of the Assyrian Empire instead of for Elam. However, access is only to the queen. So this is for the continuation of the legitimate bloodline that everyone else is potentially accessible but not accessed. Uh, while only her, she is in this exclusive space inhabited by this royal couple, a space that embodies the unity, prosperity, and stability um, of the Assyrian Empire. So, thank you.